Welcome to the New Books Network. Xi Jinping will probably rule China for life. So what does he want to do? What does he believe in? What does he mean for China and for the world? Well, Su Lin Wong has made an excellent podcast on him. It's called The Prince. It was made for The Economist, and she joins me now. Welcome to you. Thanks very much for having me, Owen. The Prince. Why Why did you call it The Prince? So initially, it was a reference to two different things. First of all, the fact that Xi Jinping himself is a princeling. So he was born into Chinese Communist Party royalty. His dad fought alongside Mao Zedong and is considered one of the founding fathers of modern China. And so Xi Jinping's generation of children whose parents fought in the revolution are, are called princelings. So it's, first of all, it's a reference to that, but it's also a reference to Machiavelli's famous text, The Prince, which is all about power, how it's won, how it's lost, and you know how far you can fall if, if you do lose power. But as I was making the series, I realized that The Prince actually refers to a couple of other things. So we're actually looking at who Xi Jinping is and the the extent to which he's a man on a mission. So it's kind of like a reference to, I don't know, the Lord of the Rings or the Lion King where you have this, this person uh, or lion who feels like they're a part of something bigger than themselves. And, you know, Xi Jinping sees himself as a true inheritor of the Chinese Communist Party revolution. And it was something that was really drilled into him and his brothers and sisters by his parents. And so he now... Th- sees him, his role as making China even stronger and even bigger and better. So, so that's another kind of uh, reference to, to the prince. But it's also a reference to the fact that he isn't yet king. He hasn't yet reached the pinnacle of his power. So, you know, most Chinese leaders for the past few decades have ruled for around 10 years. But what we've just seen is Xi Jinping's 10 years pass and he's seems totally disinterested in stepping down. And so we're expecting him to stay on, you know, for at least another five years, perhaps 10 years for even longer than that. Uh, And so, you know, we wanted to allude to the fact that, you know, more is yet to come from him. Yes, well, I mean, that that third term has has been secured since you made the podcast, I guess. So, So maybe if you're making it today, it would be the king. Maybe, yes. I guess we'll have to wait and see, though, what happens over the next five, ten years, because I'm not sure if, you know, this particular moment in time is when he's at the very, very peak of his power or if that is still to come. Yeah. So so just to begin with his childhood, because uh, you describe some utterly extraordinary things about what happened to him as a boy, scarcely believable, I mean, you know, of which the most striking is he, he lived in a cave very short of food, uh, sometimes eating raw meat. And he was there for some years. Can you you just tell us how he ended up in in that cave? That's right. So even though Xi Jinping was born into Communist Party royalty and he had an incredibly privileged life for the first nine years or so, you know, he had, he lived in a very fancy compound. Uh, This compound had security guards and nannies and housekeepers. And he and his brothers and sisters went to top boarding schools and, you know, sort of had access to Russian books and good quality food, relatively speaking. And you have to remember that this was the 1950s in China when many, many millions of Chinese were completely impoverished and, and living you know, sort of hand to mouth without without enough food, uh, and Xi Jinping had a had a very very fortunate existence compared to most Chinese of that generation. But when he was nine years old, his dad had a falling out with Mao Zedong and was purged, and that really hit Xi Jinping and the rest of his family. So he, you know, was bullied in school. He became ostracized. And then the Cultural Revolution started, which was an incredibly traumatic time in modern Chinese history. Uh, You know, there were so many Chinese people who were beaten, tortured, killed by these mobs loyal to Mao Zedong known as Red Guards. And these Red Guards also attacked Xi Jinping and he talks about how they gave him five minutes to live and he genuinely feared 
be his life. But then, you know, they change their mind and these red guards let Xi Jinping go. Uh, he talks of this other experience where he was dragged into a courtyard along with five adults and all of them were uh, rounded up, put on a stage and people shouted slogans and, and labeled them as counter-revolutionaries. Uh, the red guards were there again. And what was extraordinary was Xi Jinping's own mother was also there at this time and was yelling down with Xi Jinping and pumping her fist into the air. So this was all happening, you know, just as Xi Jinping was uh, a teenager, you know, around the time he was 13 years old or so. And, and then the Cultural Revolution moved into a new phase where Mao Zedong thought that the chaos of the cities was spinning out of control. And he wanted the urban youth to learn from the peasants and, you know, experience hard labor. And as a result, he sent millions of urban Chinese youth to the countryside. And Xi Jinping was one of them. And so he he was sent to this village, you know, very near actually where his father previously had been based. It was a very strong party, uh, a revolutionary party base. But but Xi Jinping um, talks about how he was absolutely shocked when he first arrived because conditions were so terrible. He was covered in flea bites. There was there wasn't enough food to eat. He eventually came across a piece of raw meat, and he hadn't had meat in such a long time that he ate it raw. His younger brother came to visit him and was just absolutely flabbergasted at the condition Xi Jinping was living in. You know, um, he his younger brother became covered in flea bites. Xi Jinping begged his younger brother not to tell their mom about just how terrible life in the countryside was. Xi Jinping fled back to Beijing where he was arrested and sentenced to hard labor and he he ended up having to lay sewer pipes. And eventually he, he did return to Yangjiahe, this um, this village that he lived in, and uh, you know the official narrative is that he then decided to make a real go of it and and try to embrace life in the countryside and win over the the farmers. And so as a result, he spent seven years in a cave in this village and and missed out, like many of his generation, on his schooling. So he you know didn't do high school uh, and then got into a very, very sort of strange university program if if looked at it from this perspective of, of 2022. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a childhood, isn't it? I mean, with his mother denouncing him and, and not enough to eat, it would make you very resilient, but also, you imagine, very emotionally brittle and, and, and have a deep impact on your personality. Yeah, I think... One thing that is really important to understand about Xi Jinping is his absolute fear of chaos and his obsession with control. And that's something we see today in in how he rules China. But I think, you know, there were so many millions of Chinese of Xi Jinping's generation who at the end of the Cultural Revolution were so traumatized by it that they wanted nothing to do with the Chinese Communist Party. And so they, you know, went into business or they decided to really distance themselves. And there were also people who wanted nothing even to do with China and migrated overseas to, you know, the UK, Australia, the US, Canada. But Xi Jinping drew a very, very different lesson. And it wasn't that he thought that the Chinese Communist Party in and of itself was bad. It was that he thought the party had lost control. And if he ever seized power, if he ever rose to the top of the party, he would make sure that the chaos of his childhood would never be repeated under his watch. And the party would be much more in control under him. And that's exactly what we're seeing now in China. Yeah, just two two more points about um, his childhood before we move on to his uh, political career. His, his sister committed suicide in the midst of all this. That's right. Xi Jinping has a video where he talks about how he's, you know, only cried a handful of times. And there's a bit of a joke that Xi Jinping has officially only cried four times. But one of those times he describes is when he was in Liangjiahe, you know, living in the cave, and he received um, news that his sister had died and he was devastated and sort of found a quiet corner and and cried because he didn't want anyone else to see him. But, you know, the, sto- it, the story goes and it's so hard to find out so many things about Xi Jinping. And so, you know, based on reporting um, that various journalists have done, the story goes that Xi Jinping's older sister 
saw all the abuse and violence around her during the Cultural Revolution and decided she just couldn't handle um, handle it anymore. And, and so she apparently committed suicide tragically. Yeah. And, and the second point uh, and final point about his childhood, you say he didn't go to school. He's, he's basically uneducated, but he, he is an autodidact, isn't he? He, did, he read a lot. Xi Jinping has talked about how when he went to the countryside, he spent a lot of time reading all kinds of books. And I think many of his generation, they're known as sent down youth, have similar kinds of stories. They would trade books with each other. Um, Xi Jinping talks about how he would like find an egg or two, which were, you know, very, very precious commodities back then and and boil them and, and gift them to someone who had a book that he wanted to read. Uh, so, you know, it does seem like he genuinely did really have a, a thirst for knowledge back then. And um, he, he has also talked about how he, he missed out on so much schooling and, and, and yeah, that's something that he regrets. Uh, but also for sort of, there is a group of perhaps more liberal, intellectual Chinese who scoff that Xi Jinping is, is very uneducated because uh, of how old he is and because of modern Chinese history and, and the fact that he really missed out on high school. Right. So we just need to understand how he got from the cave, as it were, to university. And then his first job was, was in, in the military, wasn't it? So can you just take us through how that happened? So Xi Jinping applied to go to university and and as the story goes it, it because um it was the local government the local cadres who got to decide you know which people got to go to university from this village that he was in it's very likely that the fact that he came from such a prominent family and his dad previously was in that region of China, those factors would have really, really helped Xi Jinping get into university. So, so then he goes back to Beijing. He does his his degree, uh, even though you know he it was probably the, the focus was really on ideology rather than on chemical engineering, which was his purported major. And then he graduates and gets a job with one of China's top military officials who was very good friends with Xi Jinping's dad. And this this man, Gong Biao, his child at the time worked for Xi Jinping's dad. So it's sort of like, you know, these two high ranking Communist Party officials uh, made sure that uh, their kids were, were looked after by by friends. You know, nice, nice old nepotism there. Uh, but it really was a very, very important three years for Xi Jinping because he saw so many things up close that would be very, very helpful for him for the rest of his career. So he he learnt about the importance of ensuring that the People's Liberation Army, China's military, was loyal to the Chinese Communist Party. So China's military is not the military of the country, you know, unlike in many other countries like, say, the UK. China's military, the People's Liberation Army, is the military of the Chinese Communist Party. But at that time, it was considered incredibly weak. It had just been defeated in a humiliating war with Vietnam that it thought it was, you know, bound to win. And uh, it also was sort of trying to learn as much as it could from America and Gung Biao, you know, takes a trip to America when Xi Jinping is working for him as his personal secretary. And so uh, Xi Jinping, you know, talks about how Gung Biao was uh, very, very cautious and so uh, didn't want Xi Jinping to take notes in meetings. So he would have to memorize everything Um and remember it all, uh, which is apparently a habit that Xi Jinping c- continues to this very day. So, you know, I think those three years with Gong Biao were very, very educational for Xi Jinping. But what is incredibly interesting is that after three years, Xi Jinping could have had a very cushy career in Beijing, like many other princelings, you know, moving between various central government departments and relying on their, his family name. But he gives it all up and decides to go to a rural county and as a deputy party secretary and, and work his way up through the Chinese provinces, which is another career path that is, you know, 
very, very common among party members at the very top of the party. And it's kind of like doing a communist party NBA, you know, instead of going off to a business school, you, you go to various provinces around the country and, and you work sort of from the bottom up. And what is very important about that is that, you know, Chinese politics is incredibly brutal. And so Xi Jinping would have seen all kinds of infighting and factions and corruption, you know, bear in mind this, this was, China in the 1980s, China in the 1990s, uh, very, very different from today. Uh, and, and so he would have seen a lot of the, chi- of the country's problems up close himself. So, so that's interesting that he, he, he chose to go to the provinces rather than have a good life in Beijing. So you, you must have a sense of the man now. I mean, you, you've offered a few explanations. It, it could be to, to stay out of trouble. It could be because he was ideologically driven and wanted to help uh, a province. It could be that he was uh, very ambitious and worked out this was the best route to the top. What What do you think? I think it's the latter, that he's very, very ambitious. And, you know, there there are memoirs that I read while reporting out The Prince. And one family friend writes about how at the time, many, many people didn't understand Xi Jinping's decision. But Xi Jinping himself thought that if he stayed working for this top military official, his faction would only be this military official's people and it would be far too narrow, you know, especially as um, this military official, Gong Biao, retired. And so Xi Jinping realised that he was going to need to build his own political base and that's exactly what he's done. If you look at who he surrounds himself with now, it's people who have worked for him over the past 30 years in the various Chinese provinces that he was posted in. So, you know, he was really, really playing the long game, even at the very, very start of his career. Now, he married, he's been married twice. So why don't we deal with that, uh, both, both of those marriages now? First wife and second wife, please. So his first wife was the daughter of the Chinese ambassador to the UK at the time that they were married. Uh, and it, uh, yeah, we tried to find out information about her. I would have loved to interview her. There were so many people I would have loved to interview for, for the prince that I wasn't able to. Uh, but, you know, th- there's reporting that the marriage was a very unhappy one. They fought a lot. And she eventually decided that she wanted to go back to the UK and Xi Jinping thought that his career and his future was in China. Um, So there's a lot we don't know about their relationship, but, you know, from what we can glean, it sounds like it was a very unhappy one. And, uh, you know, they both seem to have pretty different aspirations. And so after just a few years, they uh, split up and and divorced. And then uh, while he was in Fujian, uh, in the 80s, Xi Jinping met his second wife through a mutual friend, Peng, and his wife's his current so his second wife, his current wife, is Peng Li Yuan, who is a very very famous singer in China. You know, she has a bunch of albums on Spotify. She performs at very high profile galas at Chinese New Year. You know, many most people in China would would know who she she is and and the joke was when they first got together that no one had any idea who Xi Jinping was but everyone knew uh who who Peng Liyuan was and and Xi Jinping himself I think has joked about how like he's Peng Liyuan's husband that does raise the very interesting question of whether she was so rich through her work that he didn't need to be corrupt because uh, I mean you know, all these officials, by your account and other accounts, you know, there was a, so much corruption around at this time he was climbing the ladder. And it's hard to believe that he, he was completely clean, but maybe he didn't need money. I think that's right. I'm not sure if it's to do with Peng Li Yuan as much as his family name. The best evidence we have of this is a WikiLeaks cable where a friend of Xi Jinping speaks to this American diplomat and speculates that Xi Jinping probably wouldn't be corrupted by money because of who his family is and his family name. You know, everyone in China knew who Xi Jinping was. So that probably made it easier for him to get things done. 
but what he might be corrupted by is power. What's what's his attitude to the people who have made lots of money? I mean, I think this you use the phrase, or I, I sort of gather the phrase from your podcast that that he doesn't like the nouveau riche. You know, he doesn't like these people who've made enormous amounts of money very quickly, often through corruption. Well, actually, the, the WikiLeaks cable talks about this as well, and how he was disgusted by the nouveau riche, and you know, if he this cable speculates that if he ever came into power the nouveau riche would need to watch out. And what we've seen over the past few years are extraordinary crackdowns on, for example, China's biggest tech companies. We've seen that they've had to, you know, give quote unquote donations to the country and to the party uh, and, and sort of spread the wealth, so to speak. Xi Jinping has this very famous campaign called Common Prosperity, which is also about trying to narrow the wealth gap. So uh, I would say that that WikiLeaks ca- cable stands up pretty well today. So, so you're saying he, he craves order. That's one of his key characteristics. But another is, by the sounds of it, he's almost quite puritanical. Yes, I think Xi Jinping is puritanical and conservative. And if you look at what has happened over you know, the past 10 years as he's been in power, we've seen a shift and a real emphasis on quote unquote family values. And, you know, he wants young Chinese men to stop playing video games and get up and, you know, do push-ups and serve in the military. And he wants women and 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 bear in mind when the Chinese Communist Party first took power, they were considered reasonably progressive and, you know, um, had a bunch of laws that that tried to improve the plight of women and tried to sort of get rid of feudal attitudes towards women. But if, if we look at what has happened over the past 10 years, Xi Jinping now wants women to get married, stay at home, have babies, have many babies. We've seen, you know, real crackdown on on feminist activism as well as all kinds of other activism. Uh, so I think, you know, Xi Jinping is is much, much more conservative than than many people expected. In reporting The Prince, I went through a bunch of archive that um, I, I found on YouTube, and it's pretty extraordinary how much uh, is out there and, you know, reasonably candid information that and interviews that Xi Jinping and his wife Peng Liyuan did back when they, you know, were, were less sort of famous before he became leader. And there's an interview that Peng Liyuan does with a Hong Kong talk show in the 1990s where she talks about, and, and the hosts say, you know, it must be so difficult for Xi Jinping, you know, to be Peng Liyuan's husband. And Peng Liyuan is like, oh, no way, I would never marry a guy who I thought was beneath me. In fact, you know, I was specifically looking for a man who could control me, who could tame me, who had lofty aspirations and ideals, who I looked up to, who was really capable. Uh, so it's interesting. That's an interesting insight, I think, into the dynamics of, of Xi Jinping's marriage. And, and at this time, he is, is this when he went to Iowa? There's this extraordinary story about him going to, to, to sort of live in a quite normal house in, in America. That's right. That's uh, 1985. Tell us about that. Xi Jinping and four other officials from Hebei province, which was where he was stationed at the time. So, you know, just in terms of the chronology, chronology of his life, that was when he had decided he didn't just want a cushy career in Beijing and he was going to rough it out in the provinces. So he goes off to this rural county in Hebei and he ends up on this two-week delegation to Iowa, of all places. And the night before the delegation leaves, Xi Jinping's dad calls them all over for dinner and says, learn how to feed our people. So they fly over to Iowa and show up and uh, we we visited Iowa for the podcast and interviewed a bunch of people who hosted Xi Jinping in 1985. And the story goes that Xi Jinping and the four other delegates were really, really scared to leave their hotel room because they had grown up bombarded by propaganda. And so they were terrified of what might happen to them if they walked out onto the street. But, you know, they were also very polite. They brought gifts for everyone, uh, but didn't seem to bring much else. We interviewed the guy who drove them around Iowa in 1985, and he said he soon realized that all five Chinese men had only brought one suit 
And so every night they would wash their shirts and socks in the hotel so that they'd be all ready for the next day. Nonetheless, they seem to have a really, really great time. And the very, very famous part of the trip is that they spent two nights in this small town called Muscatine in Iowa. And what was really memorable about those two nights was they did a homestay. So the rest of the time they were mostly in hotels. But Xi Jinping stayed in this house in this small town in a bedroom covered in Star Wars posters and Star Trek posters because um, the son who uh, of, of the family in the house, which hosted Xi Jinping, was off at university. And he had a host sister who recounts how she had asked him if he had watched any American movies. And he talks about how he, he had seen both The Godfather and... The Deer Hunter, which uh, are interesting picks uh, for American movies that he's what he had watched. Uh, he tried popcorn for the first time. They um, a, a bunch of locals in Muscatine organized a potluck dinner, and uh, people we interviewed in, in Iowa were saying that they really struggled to explain what a potluck dinner was. But once Xi Jinping and the other Chinese delegates showed up, they had a great time. They you know took a boat down the Mississippi. And, and as a result, when Terry Branstad, the then governor of Iowa, became the U.S. ambassador to China, this would have been, I guess, in 2012, around that time, he went to present his credentials to Xi Jinping and all Xi Jinping could do was talk about how much he loved Iowa to the to the point that he took out his itinerary from 1985 and showed it to Terry Branstad and who we also interviewed and, and Ambassador Branstad recalls how he was just like totally blown away by the fact that, you know, after all these years, Xi Jinping still had that itinerary. It's an extraordinary story and, I mean, a great credit to American diplomatic manoeuvrings that they spotted the future leader of China and managed to uh, get him to a house in Iowa uh, to to see America, but but no... I, I'm not sure if that was or... um, American <laughs> diplomacy. I think it was just pure <laughs> yeah. luck. <laughs> Yeah, maybe, maybe. But uh, uh, well, anyway, an extraordinary thing to happen. And did it leave any impression with him beyond a love of Iowa? Did he did he change his views at all about the United States? Did he see it in a different light? I think that's a great question. And this was actually a story in the prints that my producers and I really struggled over. Because I think for China watchers and China journalists, many of us view Xi Jinping's time in Iowa as a red herring, as kind of irrelevant to understanding how Xi Jinping views the world and specifically America. And it doesn't really explain why China now has such um, an aggressive stance in terms of its foreign policy. But my producers were insistent that we include the story because it was so whimsical and and um, compelling. And, you know, I have to give them credit where credit is due. And, and they were right that it's just such fun, magical story in a way. But I think that's that's really what it is. And if we want to understand what actually drives Xi Jinping, if we want to understand his attitude to America, we have to look elsewhere. And I think the the most important place to look is a speech that he gave in Mexico in 2009, just as he was leader in waiting. Uh, and I think that is much more revealing of what he actually thinks. And he he's in Mexico talking to uh, a bunch of Chinese businessmen there. And he he's pretty candid and sort of off the cuff. And he, he talks about how, you know, uh, there are some people, some foreigners with full bellies and nothing better to do with their time. And they just constantly criticize China. But China, you know, doesn't export revolution you know, China's just sticking to itself, you know, why are we constantly being criticised? Um, and I think, you know, that speech is much more revealing of what Xi Jinping thinks of America's attitude. And, and you know, since he came into power, we've seen the rise of these so-called wolf warrior diplomats out of China um, and much, much more aggressive actions from, from the Chinese Communist Party, especially towards the West. Right. So it's fair to say, is it, that he sees the West as decadent, arrogant and fundamentally anti-Chinese? Yeah, I think he, he thinks that America is trying to keep China down 
And he also says he has a very famous line about how the West is in decline and the East is rising. And right now we are witnessing changes unseen in a hundred years. So he sees this as this turning point um, as China grows, you know, bigger and stronger as Xi Jinping inherits the party's revolution and, and tries to make China bigger and stronger. He he thinks that, you know, the West is um, selfish and doing whatever it can to, to keep China down. Now, then, just before we come to the period when he's actually at the top of the top of the political tree and he's in power, just a couple of other things. One is, is pretty clear that when he saw the Arab Spring, when he saw Tiananmen, when he saw the fall of the Soviet Union, he drew the lesson, you've got to stay strong at the centre, right? That's right. I think the collapse of the Soviet Union is a really, really important moment in terms of trying to understand the Chinese Communist Party. And and I think one, one point I would make is it's impossible to understand Xi Jinping without understanding the Chinese Communist Party. And we spend quite a bit of time in The Prince exploring, you know, what the party is and, and what it wants. And one really, really important point is that the collapse of the Soviet Union in the West is celebrated and welcomed and is considered this joyous moment. But in China, it's the opposite. And for the Chinese Communist Party, the collapse of the Soviet Union still haunts them to this very day. And when Xi Jinping came into power, there was this documentary that was put out studying why the Soviet Union collapsed that was disseminated up and down throughout the party that officials had to watch to learn the lessons and make sure that those lessons were never repeated by the Chinese Communist Party. And what Xi Jinping has said is that the Soviet Union and the party there had become, you know, so corrupt and, you know, there was a lack of ideological discipline. And as a result, the people of the Soviet Union lost faith in the party. And then Gorbachev wasn't man enough to keep the Soviet Union together. And so the, you know, not man enough quote is a very, very famous Xi Jinping quote. And what, we, what we've seen over the past 10 years with Xi Jinping is that when he came to power in 2012, China was in crisis and the Chinese Communist Party was in crisis. And I remember back then people were genuinely speculating if the party might collapse. You know, there was rampant infighting at the very top of the party, which is the largest political organization in the world with nearly 100 million members. So many more people than the population of Germany. It's just extraordinary. Uh, But there was political infighting at the very, very top of the party. Uh, The corruption was, was rife. There were hundreds of thousands of protests happening across the country, you know, over all kinds of things, air pollution, unfair working conditions, low level corruption, land reclamation. And uh, Xi Jinping came in and rolled out a signature corruption crackdown, which, you know, did genuinely crack down on corruption, but was also very politically expedient. And he was able to use this campaign to eliminate many of his political rivals. And, you know, once he had used his corruption campaign to sort of uh, crack down on the party, he then really ramped up the ideology within the party. And so now we see all kinds of stories about how party officials have to really study the party's ideology. Uh, Children in school have to learn about Xi Jinping thought. If you work in an office, you know, during the business day, you have to do study sessions about the Chinese Communist Party. And, and this, this ideology is, is mostly just about how important the party is and how China cannot be ruled by any other institu- institution aside from the party. It's all about, you know, consolidating the Chinese Communist Party's grip on the country. And so we can see that Xi Jinping has really learnt the lessons and really studied what happened to the Soviet Union and is doing many, many things to try to make sure that the same collapse doesn't happen in in China for the party there. Before he took over, uh, he, uh, uh, well, in your podcast, you say he went missing for 15 days. It's it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of extraordinary story. And you, you couldn't work out what was happening, where he was, what was going on. Have, have you, since you put the podcast out, has anyone come forward and said, I know what was happening at that time? What, what was happening? <laughs> 
uh, I wish. (laughs) No, unfortunately not. So I have to say that we agonized over that opening of the series and, you know, how, how to sort of start this, this extraordinary story of the life and times of Xi Jinping. And my very, very brilliant producer, Sam Colbert, eventually came up with this opening of what if we look at that those extraordinary 15 days when Xi Jinping disappeared just before he took power in 2012. And the reason we went with that is because is not because we know what happened. It's because we wanted to make the point that so much of Xi Jinping's life is a mystery and is unknowable. And, you know, to this very day, we still don't know why he disappeared. I mean, there's all kinds of rumors, there's all kinds of speculation, but to be totally honest, I don't know. We saw a very interesting parallel at the recent party congress this year in 2022 with this extraordinary scene in front of the world's cameras and in front of the world's media where the former leader of China, Hu Jintao, was sort of escorted off the stage and unceremoniously kind of dismissed. And the official party line was that he fell ill and so he had to leave. But it was just really, it was a very extraordinary moment for people who follow Chinese politics to see a former leader of the country sort of treated in that way. And what I take from all that, what, what I thought was very, very extraordinary was just how everyone on stage reacted in that moment. And everyone just sort of looked straight ahead, stony faced. Uh, you know, if your former boss falls ill, I don't feel like, you know, that is the natural reaction. And I think what it is, is that everyone is so terrified of Xi Jinping that they were all just taking their cue from him and he wasn't really reacting. So everyone else didn't react as Hu Jintao was, was sort of hauled off stage. But but the point is that we don't actually know what went down between Xi Jinping and Hu Jintao. We probably never will. So once again, we're up against the black box of Chinese politics. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you've set it up very well, his period in power. You know, he's he's a nationalist. He believes in the party. He believes in order. He's quite puritanical. Uh, he believes in strong central government. Uh, and since he's been in power... He has, tell me uh, if I'm wrong about any of these, he's closed down internet freedoms. He has moved against corruption. He's been very tough on the Uyghurs. He's been very nationalistic. And he has got himself and his ideas into the Constitution. That 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 sums up his, his 10 years? Yeah, I think that's, that's right. You know, China has become much more authoritarian and much less free under Xi Jinping. Yeah, and so... The, the, I mean that that I mean we've dealt with it very briefly. Is there anything else you want to say about those two five year terms that we need to think about as before we turn our mind to where, where all this could go in the future? So very very briefly, I would say that when Xi Jinping took power, he first seized control of the Chinese Communist Party, as I just explained. You know, in terms of his signature corruption crackdown and the ideological campaign. And once he seized control of the Chinese Communist Party, he used the party to seize control of China and the 1.4 billion people there. And what we saw, as you mentioned, was, you know, a real ramp up in terms of censorship, propaganda, surveillance. And so, you know, he now has these tools at his disposal that are becoming increasingly sophisticated with AI and algorithms. So, you know, the censorship machine, the propaganda machine, the surveillance machine coupled with AI is becoming ever more powerful. And then he was able to use that toolkit to really crack down on all kinds of groups, um, you know, whether it, it was, you know, religious groups like Christians or activists or human rights lawyers or LGBT groups on university campuses, or as I was saying earlier, you know, feminists. Uh, and so we've really seen a clamp down on that. It's uh, not looking particularly optimistic going forward. Right. Well, I mean, that, that, that's that's the point I wanted to get to, because the, I guess there are people in the West who are worried about China and don't really want to live in a world dominated by China. And I suspect some of them are a bit hopeful that Xi Jinping has overreached and that China will become unstable because it will be dependent on one dictatorial leader as it was under Mao. Is Is that the right way to look at it? I definitely think there are huge headwinds ahead for 
the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and I think you've you've identified one really, really important one, which is this question of succession. And, you know, there's been a bunch of really, really good academic research that shows when leaders name a successor, the chances of dynast you know, the, the dynasty continuing or the party continuing or whatever it is um, that the leader is is ahead of continuing uh, really increase. And and when they do not name a successor, the chances of dynastic collapse or a party collapsing or, you know, falling into chaos increases. And so history suggests that that, that is a pattern. Uh, and and what we've seen just recently after the party congress is that Xi Jinping did not name a successor, which again is you know breaking with convention because sh- traditionally Chinese leaders do name a successor, and we've seen him surround himself with loyalists, which raises another real concern of what kind of information is getting to the very top, you know, getting to the big guy. Uh, is it good, accurate information, or are people now too scared? to tell Xi Jinping, you know, what's actually going on across that the vast country of China. Um, so there's this other question of, of information flows. And so I think, you know, the party under Xi has built incredibly powerful machines, you know, like the censorship machine and propaganda machine I was talking about earlier. And it's got all kinds of tools to try to repress dissent. But The biggest moments of crisis for the Chinese Communist Party historically have been political infighting at the very, very top of the party. We saw that in 1989. Uh, You know, people, we we might remember images of idealistic students and workers in Tiananmen Square, but actually behind the scenes, there was all kinds of political infighting at the very, very top of the party back then. And then we saw it again as Xi Jinping took power in 2012 with his very charismatic rival, Bo Xi Lai, who was sort of vying for power. Uh, Xi Jinping eventually eliminated him and, and his faction. But, you know, I think there is a risk that that if something were to happen to Xi Jinping, if he gets sick in office, if he dies in office, there could be a split or a rupture at the very, very top of the party and and succession becomes a real risk to the future of the Chinese Communist Party. It's so hard to know ab- about what, what is going to happen in, in elite Chinese politics, but it's, it's possible that Xi Jinping stays on for many, many more years. Now then, what about Taiwan? Is there anything in what he's said that gives us a real indication of how far he's prepared to go to, to, to win ta- Taiwan? Xi Jinping has talked a lot about Taiwan over the past several years. And and what he says is that um, he wants the crisis over over Taiwan to be resolved peacefully and he wants reunification to happen peacefully. But he also hasn't eliminated the possibility of using military force. And and that's why Taiwan is now becoming such a hot button issue. And and it's becoming, you know, something that we all need to watch very carefully because of the risk that China might invade Taiwan. The thing I would point out here is that in the West, Taiwan is viewed as this vibrant democracy and a self-governing island. But in China, Taiwan is seen as a renegade province of the People's Republic of China. And it's it's seen as um, the last outstanding issue of the Chinese Civil War. And given who Xi Jinping is, given he believes he's a true inheritor of the Chinese Communist Party's revolution, he really believes that he needs to resolve this one outstanding issue of his father's generation. So what, one last question to you. You're, you're, you know, you've made this amazing podcast uh, you're a Chinese origin with an Australian accent. I imagine that part of you is proud of China's rise. On the other hand, you're a journalist asking difficult questions and uh, I, I think can't go to China. Where does that leave you personally? What, what's your, as you look ahead to what is very likely to be a much more Chinese dominated world, how do you think about that? Are you looking forward to it? Are you anxious about it? What, what, what do you think? I've thought about this question a lot and and you're right you know I I am Australian of Chinese heritage and I really identify with both parts of that both being Australian and also being of Chinese heritage and I think you know what what 
concerns me is the idea that the Chinese Communist Party gets to define what being Chinese is. Because, you know, there are hundreds of millions of Chinese all over the world, or hundreds of millions of people of Chinese heritage like me all over the world. And I, I don't think many of us would identify with, you know, Chineseness as defined by Xi Jinping and as defined by the Chinese Communist Party, which is increasingly about being loyal to this political institution that caused immense suffering for many of our ancestors and, you know, immense trauma. And it is one of the reasons that there are so many people in the Chinese diaspora outside of China. So, yeah, I I very much, you know, identify with the Chinese side of my um, identity, but the idea that it gets to be defined by the Chinese Communist Party is is definitely not uh, something that, that I support. OK, well, look, thank you very much, Su Lin Wong. And the podcast is is great. And you can, uh, if you want to listen to it, I should just say it, it sort of covers modern Chinese history as well, really. So we've, we've concentrated on Xi Jinping, but you've got a lot of material about some of the big corruption cases and some of the big political squabbles and so on. So it, it's all easy to download. And thank you very much indeed for your time, especially I think you're on holiday. So really double thanks. <laughs> thanks so much for having me, Owen. It's been great.